Hear the reading of God's word, Psalm 119, verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly from my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort and my affliction that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord." Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my song in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. When I was in 10th grade in my English class, we were reading the book, Lord of the Flies. Remember that book? Great decision to make a bunch of teenagers read a book about what would happen if a bunch of teenagers got stuck on an island and formed their own government. Well, there's this part in the book where one of the characters picks up this conch shell off the beach. And I was a 10th grade boy, and Anchorman had just come out with Will Ferrell. And so I looked at my neighbor, and I went, ooh, news team, assemble. And my teacher looked at me and stared at me and smiled. And she's like, very good, Justin. The conch shell is a symbol in this book. And I looked at her, and I remember thinking a few different things. Number one, I'm glad she didn't understand what I really just said in (laughs) class. Number two, why is everything in literature a symbol? Number three, she seems to be reading a different book than I'm reading. I just don't understand how she got that out of this book. And 
It might feel that way to you this morning, listening to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the largest chapter in all of the Bible. It's the largest psalm that we have. It's actually an acrostic poem. So you'll notice under different headings, there's uh, different Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabet. So it goes through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And the first letter of every word in each verse in that section begins with that letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It is an acrostic poem about a love for God's word. But maybe as I was reading this section uh, for you this morning, for all of us, you felt like the 10th grade version of myself. I don't know what book this guy is reading, but this is different than the Bible I'm reading. How am I supposed to feel like that about this book? Maybe you come in here this morning and you feel like the Bible is inspiring. You like the book, you're inspired by some of the stories in the book, but you're like, man, Psalm 119, that's next level for how I feel about this book. Maybe you come in here and you're skeptical about this book. Feels like this book is written by a bunch of old dead people and I feel like there should be reason to doubt it. Maybe that's you. Maybe you come in here and you feel very confused by this book. You've tried to read it. You've tried to study it. You've tried to help it make sense, but it just really doesn't fit together like you want it to. You don't really understand it. But regardless of where you're coming from this morning, Psalm 119 might feel like a bit of a stretch. Man, this guy seems to have an appreciation for this book that is so far ahead of where I'm coming from this morning. And that's what I want to talk to us about this morning. How can we appreciate and love God's word like the psalmist loves God's word in this passage? So we want to look at three things this morning. One, how should we appreciate God's word? Number two, why we don't appreciate God's word, at least like we should. And finally, how we can appreciate God's word like we should. So first, how should we appreciate God's word? Well, in this passage, the psalmist gives us how we should think, how we should feel, and what we should do about God's word. Let me just highlight some of them for us. How should we think about God's word? Well, first, God's word gives life. We see this in verses 37, verse 40, and verse 50. Secondly, God's word is good. We see this in verse 39. So when we think about God's word, how should we think about it? Well, it gives us life and it is good. Well, how should we feel about God's word? Well, first, it is to be delighted in, verses 35, 47, 72. It is to be trusted, verse 42. It is to be hoped in, verse 43 and 49. It should be loved, verse 48. It should comfort us in affliction, verses 50 and 52. It produces praise, in verse 62. And finally, it enables the fear of God, verse 38. That's how we should feel about this book. Finally, what should we do about it. Well, it should be observed with our whole hearts, verse 34. The most common word is that it should be kept. The the word should be kept, verse 44, 55, 56, 57, 60, 63, 67, 69. For you note takers out there, you can go back when the sermon is online and press pause. (laughs) It should be walked in verse 45. It should be declared, verse 46. It should be turned to, verse 59. And it should be learned, verses 64, 68, and 71. That's what we should do with the Word of God. Now, Hebrew thinkers and Hebrew um, writers wouldn't have had the strong divisions about think, feel, and do like we would have. So you could say, if we were uh, properly contextual here, uh, a proper Hebrew biblical author would say, we should have a wholehearted approach in love to God's word. Think, feel, and do's all together. We, We shouldn't separate them. We should wholeheartedly love and approach and enjoy God's word. Like verse 
34 says, Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. That is how we should view God's word. When I was growing up, I hated reading. I I, I didn't enjoy it. uh, And reading has made a huge difference in my life. Those of you who know me now know that I I love reading and it's really changed my life. And honestly, for me, the change was Harry Potter. I know that sounds funny. I, I, I don't mean it as a joke, but when I was a kid, I hated reading. And then the Harry Potter series came around and I devoured those books as a kid. I, I, I would show up late at Kroger I went to the book openings at Kroger. I guess I wasn't cool enough to go to Barnes & Noble. I I would show up like at, you know, 11 o'clock or something at at Kroger, and they'd have a midnight opening uh, to release the book, and they'd have them, you know, kind of a cloth under them. And at midnight, they'd take the cloth over, and I'd buy it at midnight. I'd read it until I passed out. And the rest of the weekend, I would lock myself in my room until I could finish the book. I wouldn't turn on TV. I wouldn't go on the Internet because I didn't want the ending spoiled. And I would devour the book, and I loved every moment of it. If a fictional book about a fictional boy wizard in England can produce that in a child, how much more infinitely should the true and abiding and living Word of God produce in us a similar and greater infinitely desire to devour it, but not just to be entertained by it, to keep it, to walk according to it. The all-consuming nature of that picture is exactly how we should view God's word. So let me ask you, if you're not a Christian here this morning, is that how you view the Bible? You know, I was with a friend of mine that's not a Christian the other week, and, and we were talking, and he said, you know, I like to read other religions and other kind of holy books and other religions. I find it really interesting, but I don't read the Bible because I understand that story. I grew up with it. I don't need to understand it. I, I know all the stuff. And I just leaned in, and I said, no, you don't. And we had an awkward silence. <laughs> and then he said, you're right. I don't. If you don't view the Bible like just the most amazing thing ever that you're approaching, the the greatest treasure that you could open up between pages, you're not viewing it right. If you're not a Christian and you've come to this book and you've been bored or confused or skeptical, but you haven't seen its wonders, you haven't really seen it as you should. So I'd like to invite you this morning to read it. Read the word. Don't assume because you grew up in a semi-Christian culture, you know what's in here. Start with the Gospels, the stories of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I want to dare you not to be astounded and amazed at the Jesus Christ on those pages. My non-Christian friend this morning, would you read this book? And if you are a Christian, how much easier would your quiet times or your times of personal worship be in the morning if we felt about the word like the psalmist feels about this word? You know, it's like hard for us to get up like 15 minutes early. If we felt like the psalmist felt, it'd be like, make it two hours, please. I need a minimum of two hours in this book because it's so wonderful. It's so incredible. If we really viewed the word of God like we should view the word of God, it would make getting up really easy easy to spend time in his word, but this is how we are to view it. Men in here, I I, I want to encourage you, you set the tone for how your family regards this book. You you set the tone in, in your home for how this book is admired and loved and read and focused on. Would you be like the psalmist here and and set a tone of adoration for the word? This is why at our church we do expositional preaching, preaching book by book, verse by verse, because I don't want you to miss the diamond in the midst of my attempt to be cute and clever with a smart sermon series. 
We don't want to hide this thing. We just want to lift it up and say what it says because there is treasure here. This is how we should appreciate God's word. But let's be honest. We often fall short of this. We often don't think, feel, and do with the word what this psalmist is describing here. So why? That brings us to our second point this morning. Why don't we appreciate God's word like this? And essentially the short answer is divided hearts. Look with me at a few different verses, starting in verse 34. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Verse 36, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Verse 58, entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. Verse 69, the insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Verse 70, their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. We don't appreciate God's word like we should. We don't love it like we should because our hearts aren't whole, they're divided. This is made evident at the end of 1 Chronicles. King David prays for his uh, son, Solomon, his successor, King Solomon. And do you know that the one thing he prays for him in 1 Chronicles, God, would you give my son Solomon a whole heart that he might keep your law? And the tragedy of Solomon is maybe more than any other biblical character. We see what happens when you don't have a whole heart. The, the king of Israel was supposed to have one wife and one God. But Solomon had many wives, which resulted in them bringing many religions and therefore many gods into his life. Instead of a united heart that was united to fearing God's name, a whole heart that was dedicated to giving all of himself to God, Solomon had a divided heart. The prayer that his father prayed for him did not come true. He divided his heart among many wives and many gods, and so he didn't serve and worship God with his fullness, but with leftovers at best. The ancient theologian Augustine called this problem disordered loves. It's not that we're only allowed to love God and nothing else. It's that our loves are disordered. So what we should love first, God, we tend to love 10th. And what we should love 10th, we love 100th. And what we should love second, we love 30th. Augustine said our hearts have all these loves that are disordered. They're in the wrong order. And therefore, they don't produce a whole life, a whole heart. They produce a divided heart and a divided life. All of us struggle with divided hearts because we tend to split our deepest affection between God and maybe something else. Maybe you do want to be dedicated to God, but you also really love money. You really love things. You have a divided heart. Maybe you want to love God, but you really love the approval of people. What you're really after is to get an attaboy, a girl from someone that you love, someone that you respect. Well, your, your heart is divided. Maybe you do want to love God, but you really want power. You want to be an influencer. Your heart is divided between a love of God and a love of people. Your loves are out of order. C.S. Lewis caught on to this, and I've shared this quote a lot of times uh, from up here, but I want you to listen to how he describes the heart. He says this, We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Lewis is saying the same thing the psalmist is saying, the same thing that David prayed for Solomon for. 
is that we're half-hearted. We have divided hearts. Our problem is that we haven't given God our primary love. We haven't given God our whole heart. We've given him a divided heart. My friends, if, if you think this word is boring, the problem is with you, not with the word. If we approach this and are not entranced by it like the psalmist is, it's more than likely because our heart is actually divided. We're loving lesser things more than we're loving God. So if we're supposed to appreciate and love God's word with a whole heart, but all of us are guilty of having a divided heart, How do we actually appreciate God's word like we should? And that brings us to our last point this morning. How can we properly appreciate God's word? In one sentence, here's how. Sovereign grace produces a new heart, which produces a new love, which produces new pleas. P-L-E-A-S. Sovereign grace produces a new heart, which produces a new love, which produces new pleas. Look with me at verse 41. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Now that word steadfast love is the Hebrew word chesed. It's the covenant faithful love of God. Some of your translations might say the loving kindness of God. Let your loving kindness come to me. The psalmist knows God has to make the first move. The psalmist knows that God has to act. God's love has to come to him because the psalmist with a divided heart certainly isn't going to God. So he prays, he asks, let your steadfast love come to me, your salvation according to your promise. This is the glory of the God who saves. He comes to people whose hearts are not united to his. He comes to people who have hearts that are divided and unites him with his glory and his purpose. And this great saving God who sovereignly comes to a people in need becomes all the more obvious and better in the new covenant. Ezekiel prophesies this in Ezekiel chapter 36. He says that you'll be sprinkled clean. You'll be cleansed from your idols. God will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh is what Ezekiel 36 says. So the idea here is that we have hearts of stone. They're hardened. You could put it the way the psalmist does. They're divided. They're not united with God. And the glory of the new covenant, the sovereign God who saves, is that he comes to us and he replaces a stony, divided heart with a heart of flesh that's united to him. That's what Ezekiel says. That's his picture. Jeremiah's picture in Jeremiah 31 is that God writes his law upon our hearts so that we're no longer told from the outside to do God's will, but from the inside it's bursting forth a desire to follow after him, a new heart, a heart that desires to know and follow and trust and serve God. God replaces our hearts of stone, our divided hearts, with a new heart that's united to his. He writes his law on our hearts so that we pursue him. That's what sovereign grace does. That's what happens when the steadfast love of God comes to people. And what's beautiful about this is that this is what Jesus has accomplished for us in his life, his death, and his resurrection. If you could take Psalm 119 and personify it, it would be Jesus. He is called by John, right, the Word. He is the the living Word. We have the written Word here. He is the living Word. The love for God in His Word is a person fully and finally in Jesus Christ. And He came and He dwelt among us as the only person ever who had a totally united heart to God. Someone whose loves were never divided, never disordered. He lived a perfect life among us. He died a sacrificial death on the cross. He rose again on the third day, and he promises a new heart, a heart of flesh to any 
who will repent of their sin and trust in him alone. And that is an offer for you today. That is available for you today, not just to be better, not a, you know, get through tough times with some positive thinking, a new heart, a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, a heart that didn't have God's word written on it to a heart that does have God's word written on it. That's the glory and the beauty of the offer of the gospel. That is the new covenant. That's what's offered. And this new heart, who now loves God, who has an internal motivation to follow after God, produces new pleas. There are new things new hearts ask for. Notice with me, in verse, starting in verse 33, an example of this. The, this psalmist, even though he's in the Old Covenant, he has this new heart. He's loving God. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Give me understanding that I may keep your law. Lead me in the path of your commandments. Incline my heart to your testimonies. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. Confirm to your servant your promise. Turn away the reproach that I dread. In other words, when God changes your heart, he changes your affections and your desires, and so you ask for different things. You ask for that which you don't have perfectly, an understanding and an appreciation and a love and a desire for God's word. And notice all of this asking shows our dependence on God. The psalmist is a follower of God, and yet he still needs God to give him understanding. The psalmist loves God's word, but he still needs him to lead him in the path of your commandments. The psalmist's heart is united to God's heart, but he still needs to pray, incline my heart to your testimonies. His askings, his pleas have changed from what it was before he was a follower of this great God. And that's what happens to us, right? Sovereign grace, God comes after us, produces a new heart, not a heart of stone, a heart of flesh which produces a new love. We love him now. We love his word. We love his law, even though it's incomplete on this side of heaven. And because of that new love, it produces a new plea. We ask him, please, help me love your law. Help me apply your law. Help me follow your law. It's all dependence on God's action. It's like the great hymn, uh, old hymn, Come Ye Sinners. Listen to what the hymn says. Let not conscience make you linger nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. This he gives you. This he gives you. Tis the Spirit's rising beam. All the fitness you need to love God's word like you should is to feel that you need God to help you love his word like you should. And if you have that, just know That didn't come from you either. That came from him. Beautiful. Sovereign grace in our lives. So if you're not a Christian in here this morning, and you're like, I don't have that, but I want that, ask. Ask this God. Ask this God to produce this heart in you. Ask this God to replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And just know, even in that asking, he's the one that gave you the desire to ask in the first place. It's a beautiful, glorious thing. Christian, you read this and you're like, I still don't love God's word like this. Ask. I was so convicted this week As I'm preparing a sermon about loving God's word, finding that I often, even in my preparation of sermons, can find it to become routine. I don't love God's word like this, and so I'm asking Give me understanding. Lead me in the path of your commandments. Incline my heart. Turn my eyes. Confirm to your servant your promise. Turn away the reproach I dread. Ask him before you open up this book in personal worship. Ask him, God, incline my heart to your testimonies. 
Before you listen to a sermon, ask him, God, open my ears that I might hear your word and obey it. Give me a whole heart. Unite my heart to fear your name. You know, Jesus said something amazing once. He's talking to a group of people, and he said, uh, you know, if you who are evil, I, I, I love that. He's talking to a group. You who are evil, like all of you people listening to me right now, He says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask? My brothers and sisters, we have a heavenly Father who loves to give gifts to his children, who loves his word. So do you really think, if your passion for the word is not like this, do you really think this God is going to hold out on you if you earnestly ask him for this? Not a chance. So ask. Let's pray. Oh God, we bless you this morning for your everlasting, enduring, infallible, inerrant, glorious word. We confess our hearts are often divided. So, Lord, would you give us a whole heart this morning that we might love you, fear you, keep your commandments, and love your word. Give us help, God because we certainly could not do it on our own. In Christ's good name we pray, amen.